Well, good morning and welcome to all of you. We're St. Mark Presbyterian Church at worship and we're delighted that you're part of this service. For those of you who might not know or those of you who could have forgotten, today is a communion service and so you might want to, to get your elements and have those ready if, when we get to, to that part of the service so you can partake of communion at the same time. I invite you to do that. Let us all now prepare our hearts for the highest and best of human endeavors, that is the worship of God. Let us be called to worship through the singing of this hymn. Let us now be called to confession. We all carry a, a lot of sins. We carry wounds. We carry brokenness. And sometimes we carry more than we're even aware of. And so we have in our service of worship a time to confess, basically to bring to God these burdens we carry. And so I invite you to do that now as we share together in a unison confession. And then we'll have a time of silent confession. Let us pray together. Oh, but God, we know that you call us in many ways, even through the realization of our sins and our failings, of our brokenness and need. Help us to hear your call and to have the honesty and courage to confess. Grant us grace to leave these burdens with you and to leave our many excuses as well. Grant us freedom from familiar habits that keep us from you and from each other. For we make this our prayer in Jesus' name. Here now our silent confessions. Scripture asks the question, who is in a position to condemn? And scripture answers the question, only Christ Jesus and Christ died for us, Christ rose for us, Christ reigns in power for us, Christ intercedes for us. Friends, you can believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are indeed forgiven and we're set free. All thanks be to God. Amen. All those who, as those who have received the blessing and forgiveness of God, let us also receive his peace, peace that sometimes is beyond what we can understand, but it's peace nonetheless, and then let us share that peace, signs of that peace with each other, with those with you in your, the room where you're worshiping, or with just friends, or with family members, whoever you want to share that peace with, let us do so.
Our first scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, verses 1 through 10. In those days, when there was again a great crowd without anything to eat, he called his disciples and said to them, I have compassion for the crowd because they have been with me now for three days and have had nothing to eat. If I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way, and some of them have come from a great distance. His disciples replied, How can one feed these people with bread here in the desert? He asked them, How many loaves do you have? They said, Seven. Then he ordered the crowd to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves, and after giving thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to distribute, and they distributed them to the crowd. They had also a few small fish, And after blessing them, he ordered that these two should be distributed. They ate and were filled, and they took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full. Now there were about 4,000 people, and he sent them away. And immediately he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the district of Dalmanutha. This is the word of the Lord. The second reading today also comes from Mark's Gospel, chapter 8, beginning at verse 11. The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, asking him for a sign from heaven to test him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit, and he said, Why does this generation ask for a sign? Truly I tell you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them. And getting into the boat again, he went across to the other side. Now the disciples had forgotten to bring any bread, and they had only one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them, saying, Watch out, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and the yeast of Herod. And they said to one another, It is because we have no bread. And becoming aware of it, Jesus said to them, Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes and fail to see? Do you have ears and fail to hear? Do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you collect? And they said to him, 12. And the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you collect? And they said to him, seven. And then he said to them, do you not yet understand? This is the word of the Lord. I'm not sure when I first became aware of this, but I began to notice that when I entered a room full of familiar faces, I would sometimes notice first who wasn't there. It wasn't that I didn't see the many who were there, It's just that I found myself focused on absence, you might say, rather than presence, particularly if the missing person or persons were expected. Now, some people, we all all know these people. Some people fill a room even if they only take up one seat. Often they're gregarious and affable, or maybe they're just sometimes loud or authoritative. Either way, it's easy to notice when those people are not there. But this was different. The missing person usually wasn't a fill-the-room kind of person. In fact, I might have been the only one who noticed that they weren't there. I would notice because their presence was particularly important to me. Sometimes it was because I counted on their support or maybe because I needed their perspective or their expertise or their opinion, especially if I were leading that group. But sometimes I simply noticed their absence because they were part of my life and I'd come to expect to see them in certain places. Expectations can set the context for a lot of what we see. And it can set the context of what we notice not seeing. Expectations can set in motion a series of actions and reactions In fact, expectations can narrow or expand our vision of possibility. 
If we begin with a problem, the, the who or wh what is missing, or, or with the thing that needs fixing, or the thing that isn't finished yet, then our response can be problem-driven. Whereas if we begin with who or what is there, with, with what we have to work with, then our response can become possibility-driven. That's what we see at play in these stories we've heard from Mark's Gospel this morning. Despite the amazing things these disciples had seen Jesus do, and despite the amazing things they themselves had done because of Jesus, they still approached situations with what they lacked. The theme seemed to be there's not enough. We can't do it. It's impossible. In the case of the story today, there was not enough bread in the desert to feed 4,000 people. Not any bread for the journey to feed themselves either in that second story. They seemed puzzled about what to do in the face of this daunting need that is other than just doing nothing. Well, we're three weeks into our Lenten journey and Mark, we're reading Mark's breaking news gospel and using that as our guide. You remember he opens the gospel with what seems to be an attention grabber. The words, the good news of Jesus Christ, Son of God. That's it. In the following 16 chapters, Mark tells us that this good news is like something never before experienced. And he talks about how it's experienced. It's not just spoken. It's about things that are done. It is in large part not just things that are said. It's good news in action. The action includes a stunning 13 healings taking place healings in many forms, from, from blindness to, to paralysis, from, from leprosy to, to deafness, and, and many exorcisms, the, the freeing of those tormented, tormented by demons, oppressed, and, and maybe even possessed. But in addition, Mark includes some other miracles, like the one we heard today, miracles of sufficiency, you might say, in the face of need. Well, all these miracles were stunning reversals of seemingly impossible situations. The good news of not being stuck in a compromised or oppressive life. The kingdom of God was near and wrongs were being righted. Well, in Lent, we're invited to place the story of our lives again into this story, into the story of Jesus' life and his ministry, and, and to let this life and ministry, Jesus' words, his actions, reshape our thinking and our expectations to reshape it from that of starting and ending with the problem to that of seeing possibilities and engaging what we have in addressing the situation. What we know so far about the good news of Jesus Christ, Son of God, is that his life was intentional. And in that, so are our lives also intentional. As he faced the temptation to not do the things for which he was born, so do we. He lived large, and so can we because of him. And living large begins with where we start, problems or possibilities. Today we enter two stories, the feeding of the 4,000 and a boat ride with Jesus and a small interlude between. Now, most of us are familiar with the story of the feeding of the 5,000, which, interestingly enough, is the only miracle, the only miracle of Jesus found in all four Gospels. The feeding of the 4,000, though, is only found in two Gospels. That's in Matthew's and in Mark's. This particular story is very important for Mark to include because the disciples, like us, are slow to learn, they're slow to change, no matter what they see and experience of God's presence and God's power. It shows how fixed they are on starting with what can't be done, a common human temptation. The truth is the disciples look like pragmatists to Jesus' idealism. They look like hardcore realists to his soft-hearted compassion. How could he not see that what he wanted them to do was impossible. The situation was 4,000 hungry people who had traveled to hear Jesus bring them good news, and now three days later, they were in need of something to eat before they left, and all there was here to feed them, there to feed them, was a little bit of bread, meager fare, 
that could never meet such a great need. And to make it worse, they were in the desert. The desert, an empty place, a place where there was no place to procure more bread. The disciples began as most of us would begin, with what was missing, sufficient bread in the wilderness to meet the hunger of so many, many people. What makes this story noteworthy, though, is it isn't the first time that these disciples had encountered this dilemma. They had, in fact, been a critical part of the feeding of the 5,000. Yet now, all they could see were too many needs and too many, too few resources. It's so easy to be practical in a world that really needs miracles. It's so easy to see what can't be done. A part of the good news that Jesus brought was that we don't have to keep seeing things the same way or doing them the same way with the same results. We can learn to see things anew, and it matters where we start. Will it be with what we lack or with what we have? Will it be with what is wrong or with what could be made right? Well, I became aware that I didn't just notice who wasn't in the room more than I noticed who was in the room. I had that same starting point in other spheres of life. I could notice pretty quickly what was missing, what was wrong, what was unfinished, what was overwhelming. I would often begin with the problem and not with the possibility. Had I become one of those half-empty kinds of people, I wondered, seeing only the half that wasn't there? I certainly hope not. Well, Jesus didn't berate the disciples when they say, said, how, how can we feed these people with, with bread here in the desert? He simply asked this, how many loaves do you have? He shifted the beginning point from the daunting task and the meager resources to the resources at hand, if even if seemingly insufficient. To Jesus' question, they answered seven. And Mark now continues the story. Then he ordered the crowd to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves, and after giving thanks, he broke them, and he gave them to the disciples to distribute. And they distributed them to the crowd. And they had also a few small fish, and after blessing them, he ordered that they too should be distributed. They ate and they were filled, and they took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full. What do you have? What still works? What do you want to have happen? Can you take what you have and give thanks? Can you bless it? Can you share it? Well, whatever I was and am, I became aware of the danger and the temptation of beginning with what is wrong or missing, and what is left undone, all those practical things, rather than beginning with God's larger vision and letting that be the context in which I would view then the challenge. The larger vision of God's sufficiency, not just my insufficiency, because sometimes if something is worth doing, Maybe there will be a way it can be done. What followed the story of sufficiency, even abundance, you might call that feeding, was an encounter with the Pharisees who asked Jesus for a sign to prove who he was. Well, they probably hadn't seen the miracle he had just done, but they had seen others. Their perspective, however, was already fixed. This man was a fraud. He's not who he claims to be. He is no Messiah. That's where they started, and they could go no further. He was the problem that blinded them, and they didn't want his version of God's kingdom. Well, so Mark now ends this whole section of Scripture with the, the disciples getting into a boat with Jesus, and once again, they're dealing with bread. They hadn't bought any bread. And Jesus says to them, why are you talking again about having no bread? In other words, why do you keep talking about what is wrong, what you don't have? Do you still not perceive and understand, he asks? Are your hearts hardened? 
Do you have eyes and fail to see? Do you, do you have ears and fail to hear? And then Jesus rehearsed all that they had seen and done, and he ended with, do you not yet understand? Well, the truth is, they did and they didn't. We do and we don't. No matter what the disciples had experienced, they still started from the same place. They started from what was missing or from their inadequacy for the task at hand. That was the context into which they placed a challenging situation. That was their default thinking. All they could see was a looming problem, not the possibility of God's kingdom of good news, of God's presence that could guide and provide. You know, there's always something wrong. There's always something incomplete or missing. There's always some deep and gnawing need. There's always blindness and deafness, even in eyes that can see and ears that can hear. There's always oppression and possession in people who are bound up and terribly unfree. There's always a problem to be solved. And we often feel terribly inadequate for the task of the many problems we see. No wonder all we can see is what is wrong. But that's no way to live, Jesus in as much said, as he came to help them and us see and know it doesn't have to be the way we live. Jesus came bringing good news. Remember, that's how Mark opened his gospel. Good news he ushered in. Good news he acted on and did. It was the news of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of possibility that can be the context from which we begin. And in that kingdom, and probably only in that kingdom, our meager fare, if blessed and shared, might just be the thing that changes the way things are. You see, you see, it's altogether important where we start. All thanks be to God. Amen. Would you join me now as we affirm our faith from a declaration of faith? In his history with his people in the world, God has often made material things channels through which his grace is understood and powerfully experienced. 
out of the life and ministry of Jesus, the church receives baptism and the Lord's Supper. We believe that at the Lord's Supper, the community of believers is renewed by the memory of Christ's life and death, by his real presence and the power of the Holy Spirit, and by the promise of his coming again. Christ makes himself known to us in the breaking of the bread. He offers us his body broken for our sake and his blood shed for the forgiveness of our sins. We accept his promises and gifts and depend on his life to sustain ours. In turn, we offer ourselves in thanksgiving. My friend says, we come to the table of our Lord. This may not look like enough bread, not enough since we say believers of every time and place will sit together at table. How could this possibly feed us all? Despite appearances of not being enough bread, this is still considered the joyful feast of the people of God. It's, it's the Eucharist, a word that means thanksgiving, the great thanksgiving. And in fact, there is enough here of the bread of life for all of us. Joining us at this table are, are people we know and people we don't know, people like us and people different from us. Joining us at this table are saints, that is believers, that's what the word means, believers on earth and saints in heaven. Among the saints in heaven joining us today is our friend and, and faithful teacher and leader here at St. Mark, Bill Dalton, who this past week joined the great cloud of witnesses who cheer us on. We remember Bill and we give thanks for his life. This is probably the most recent picture I'm gonna show here of Bill and Kate that we have. We'll be celebrating Bill's life a bit later as the family makes plans, but for now, for now as we come to this table, we know that Bill joins all of us here at this table of remembrance, at this table of rejoicing, at this table of, of deep and abiding connections. As the psalmist invites us, let us taste and see how good God is. Let us pray. God who formed earth and heaven and all therein and called it good. You have been from the beginning, even before time, and you will be beyond time as creator, redeemer, the Lord and giver of every good and perfect gift. You've spoken to us through creation and law, through the voices of prophets and angels, through faithful servants throughout time who gave witness to your saving love in Jesus Christ. But mostly, O oh God, you have spoken to us through your Son, Jesus Christ, who for our sakes lived and died and was raised, giving us life eternal, eternal with you and with each other. And so, O oh God, we give you our thanks and praise this day, and we ask that as we gather here at your table, that you do what only you can do, and that is pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and wine, 
that the bread we break and the cup we bless might become for us the body and blood of Christ, and together we might become the body of Christ in this world, the church faithfully serving you all our days. We make this our prayer, O God, in the name of Christ, who taught disciples to pray together, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Scripture tells us that on the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. And after giving thanks, he, he blessed and he broke it, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after the same manner, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the risen Lord's death until he comes again. My friends, these are the gifts of God for us, the people of God. And now we will share communion together. Let us keep the feast. Let us pray. Oh God, for a wide birth of love that has a place for us here at your table, we give you our thanks and we give you ourselves once again that we might more faithfully and joyfully serve you all our days in Christ and through Christ. Amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit keep you this day, keep you all your days. Amen. Amen. 